I greatly admire Brother Gold. This is the second week that I've had fellowship with him. I, I admire his courage. We were talking about the fact that we ought to set aside about six weeks once a year for prayer every night, and then about six weeks of digging in the Word of God and giving congregation to honor the fact that one plants and the other waters, but only God gives the increase. He has a lot of nerve to attempt what you call an evangelist campaign. Only a small segment of the membership support it, he tells in all the meetings. We've had many visitors, and we thank God for that. But I thank God for his courage. You must keep keeping on. All over America, we've got to destroy the false foundations that people have built their hope on. And that takes a little while. Because as long as you've got a God that's satisfying you, you'll never be interested in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now tonight we're speaking on the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father's response to the Lord's claims. Tomorrow night we're going to be speaking on the demands of the Lord Jesus Christ. He makes a demand of every human being. And the penalty for not obeying that command is to be cast into hell. Tonight, will you prayerfully consider the, some of the claims that the Lord Jesus Christ made when he was here as a preacher, preaching about his death on the cross and his exaltation rule from a throne. And I invite you to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 22, and we'll begin reading at verse 41 of Matthew 22. Now, I quit a long time ago trying to get a crowd. I know about Friday night. I also know that where you have to depend on visitors uh, to fill the pews, they are in and out. They have their own obligations. And having received this ministry at the mercy of God, we never lose hope. We never faint. We just keep plowing. There's revival on the way. Already gods are being attacked from more pulpits than used to. And men are being stripped and hunger of heart is coming everywhere. And we have everything to encourage us. I hope you can hear me as we bring to a climax this week's weeknight messages as we bring Christ's demand. The great demander, not inviter, but demander. The Lord demands something of every human being. And you do not mind him. And you'll find that he will judge you. Beginning at verse 41 of chapter 22. While the Pharisees, this is Matthew, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye? of Christ, whose son is he? And they say unto him, He's the son of David. He saith unto them, Well, if your answer is all of the truth, it was a half-truth, for he was the son of David. But half-truth will damn. It takes all of the truth, half of Christ, Trusted will damn you, but all of Christ trusted will save you. They said, you are the son of God. He asked them, who, who, whose son am I? They say, you are David's son. Well, he said unto them, verse 43, how then, over in your old scripture, the Old Testament, how then does David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, quoting the scripture, Sit thou on my right hand, how long? Till I make thine enemies thy footstool. I think the Lord is going to sit right there on the throne where it is until God does what he said he'd do. He's going to make every enemy of Christ the footstool of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he said, if you told the truth, I, I asked you, whose son am I? And you said, well, you're a man. 
You're a man. You're the son of David. Now, if that's all the truth, the Lord said, how in the world can you answer the fact that David, whom you say, I'm his son, call me Lord? And then he quotes the scripture in which David did call Jesus Christ Lord. God said, Jehovah said unto my Lord, sit thou. And that's where he is. He's sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God forever. Sit thou on my right hand. How long? Till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is it David's son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. He had him on the horns of a dilemma. If Jesus Christ was just the human descendant of a man named David, why did his father, David, address him as master, potentate, and sovereign, and desperate, and lord? Why did he call his own son his master and his lord? Nobody could answer that question. Archbishop William Temple who's gone on to glory now, when he was Archbishop of Canterbury of the Episcopal Church, Anglican Church of England, great man of God, made this cryptic statement. It is now recognized, said the Archbishop, that the only Christ for whose existence there is any evidence at all is a miraculous figure making stupendous claims. The only Christ who's got any record of at all is a miraculous figure making stupendous claims. I'm going up and down the country now preaching to unsaved people. Most church people are unsaved. And they're about the only kind of people you can get to listen to you now. The other folks just not interested at all. And they're honest and they're nice. And I'm trying to say to this generation of casual, nice, Sunday go to meeting, so called Christians, who've accepted Jesus and put him up on a shelf with the rest of their gods, and give him equal rank with their pleasures and everything else, but not first place. I'm crying aloud with a broken heart. Don't want you to go to hell. It's all or nothing with Christ. He's either God or he's not even a good man. The Jesus of the pot of the pulpit today can be accepted and leave your pride with you and leave you to live a life of sin. But the Jesus of the Bible is a miraculous figure. He came into this world by a miracle, a human mother, and no human father. He lived a spotless life, striving against sin so hard that it cost him hemorrhages of his blood like sweat. And he died on a cross. God raised him from the dead and exalted him and sat him down in the throne in his right hand until his enemies were made his footstool. That's the only Jesus the world has any record of. Now I'm going to try to talk to you a little about, about some of his stupendous claims that brand him as a fool or as God. You have to take your choice. C.S. Lewis, the head of the Department of Literature in Oxford and Cambridge, England, who speaks nightly over the BBC radio hookup nationwide, one of the great writers and thinkers and Christians of this hour, uh, has this to say about what I'm talking about tonight. I want to quote him. Mr. Lewis said, I'm trying to prevent anyone from saying the really silly thing that people often say of Christ. 
They say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Says Mr. Lewis, that's the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said wouldn't even be a great teacher. He'd be either a lunatic on a level with a man who says he's a post or else he'd be a devil of hell. You must make your choice. And bless God, you will make your choice. Either he's the son of Almighty God, or he's a madman. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and seek to kill him for a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and worship him. As your Lord and God, one thing you can't do, you can't be neutral. One thing you can't do and get by with it is like most church people do. Profess to bow to him and then ignore him every day of their life. It can't be done. If he's God, there's one place that's to bow and worship and adoration. If he's not God, he's not even a good man, or just a man to make the claims that we're going to see he made, brands him as a madman worse than Adolf Hitler. Take your choice. He's a madman, he's a lunatic, he's a poached egg, he's a devil out of hell, or he's the son of the living God, the world's redeemer and the world's Lord and the world judge. We do not come with the patronizing nonsense, says Mr. Lewis, about his being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. May I bring to you right, rather quickly tonight seven claims that the Lord made while I was here, every one of which takes it so you cannot sit on the fence, that two positions that are honorable, one is in 100% devotion to and obedience to Christ, the other is to just brand him as a fool and a madman and quit all this business about attending church and listening to the Word. Anything except the stuff they call Christianity today that names them as Savior with their lips, do not bear the mark of his discipline in their life. The first stupendous claim that I mentioned here tonight that the Lord Jesus made when he was here and he still makes them for he's alive, the first stupendous claim, he claimed to be the one who has absolutely the last word and all authority in the realm of morals. He alone has the authority to decide this is right and this is wrong. You do not have it. I do not have it. But Christ does. This is a day of moral breakdown. This is a day when our moral uh, weight our moral lives, our immorality is making America the most immoral nation on top side of God's earth. It is ironic that Charlotte, North Carolina is the second most church city in the world. There are more church members per population in Charlotte, North Carolina than any other city of the world except Edinburgh, Scotland. And yet, the crime rate in Charlotte, North Carolina is the highest of any city in America, worse than Chicago or New York City or any other. The most church city in America is at the same time 
the leader in crime, her population. It is ironic, my friends, that if you wish to find a country that's nearly as rotten and morally as America today is West Berlin and West Germany. If you wish to find the purest brand of Christianity in the world today, I'm told by people who know, you have to go to East Germany, where every time they meet in a church, every word the Sunday school teacher, every word the preacher says is taken down in shorthand by a communist member of the, of the uh, Gestapo. And yet, under that pain of excommunication and death, where the men are separate from the boys, you'll find some Christians in East Germany. But in West Germany, the moral conditions there are nearly as bad as there are in Lynchburg. Oh, why? Because this generation has refused to listen and to recognize and to bow to the word of the living Christ as to what's right and what's wrong. He claims to be the supreme authority. His word says it. I'll not take the time. But in the fifth chapter of Matthew, he's in conflict with the teaching, not of the law of Moses, but of the way the rabbis and the scribes and Pharisees had added to and taken away from the law of Moses. And over and over and over again, this prophet, this preacher, this teacher, who was known at that time as Jesus of Nazareth, he said, you've heard so and so. But I say unto you, that's heaven. They took knowledge of him that he spoke as one having authority. And he does have authority. This generation going to hell saying, I don't think it's any harm to do thus and so, but that hasn't been turned over to you. The only one who has the authoritative force about what's right and what's wrong is the Lord Jesus Christ. This generation of church members have joined the church and they say they've accepted Jesus but they haven't accepted his word about moral living they do as they please they decide themselves what's wrong and what's right in the second place now any man who makes a claim like that he's just a man he's a madman Suppose I come to Lynchburg and get up on your radio station, your television, and say, I'm here. If you understand I'm here, you come to me, I'll tell you what's right and what's wrong. Don't you go to anybody else. I'm the only one. You'd say, that guy's a fool, wouldn't you? And I would be. And Jesus Christ is either a fool or he's God. He dared to claim that his word was the last word. He mentions, he mentions adultery. He mentions murder. He mentions everything. You read it there. It takes up the whole decalogue of sins and law. He says, I've got the last word. I've got the last word. In the second place, the Lord Jesus, when he was here, made another stupendous claim in, Luke, in John chapter 3. He made a tremendous claim, verse 13 of John chapter 3. And this claim certainly brands him as a fool and a madman or as almighty God. In John chapter 3, verse 13, my Lord said, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Many years ago, I went about one o'clock in the morning to Father Divine's heaven that he had in Harlem at that time. I wanted to see what's going on. And about two o'clock, a little yellow, short, Georgia-born Negro man came down the steps, richly 
Jewel women, rich people, no fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, wives, anything, just all brothers and sisters in his kingdom is all in heaven. You come and give him all your money and he takes care of you from then on in heaven. Got John the Baptist and all the apostles, Mary Magdalene, everybody. I saw them all. And everybody got down on his knees as the Negro man walked down the steps and they said, Father divine, he is God. Father divine, he is God. Father the divine said the first time the Son of God came to the earth, he was a white man. The second time he came, he came as a Negro himself. You say, that's blasphemy. Well, what about this claim of the Lord? He's just a man. This is blasphemy too. He said, I came down from heaven. That's what he said. If he's lying about it, he's a devil. If he's telling the truth about it, he's almighty God. You see, this little stuff we give God a little of our time and a little of our money and a little of our this and a little of our that, that just lands in hell, brother. You don't do God that way. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. Now I want you to notice the third stupendous claim the Lord Jesus made, and this is just out of this world. You know this fellow known for a while as Jesus of Nazareth, known to Christians as the exalted, ascended Lord. But at this stage of the game, nobody knew who he was except a few little disciples, a few, just a little handful of disciples. Most of them just thought he was a prophet, somebody. You know what he claimed? In verse 14, 15, 14, he made this stupendous claim. He said, I have to die and be raised from the dead to purchase your redemption from the wrath of a holy God. Now, isn't that some claim for a man to make? Suppose I'd come to Lynchburg and say, I'm, I'm here to die and be buried and raised from the dead so that whosoever will believe on me might not perish but have everlasting life. Wasn't that a claim? He's either a fool, a devil, a madman, or he's the son of God. This little haphazard stuff we call Christianity today just going to land us in hell. If he's God, that settles it, brother. You worship God. Huh? You serve God. I won't bow down to you, Mr. Oligo. you just a man. Huh? The cross and resurrection, that's the gospel. As Moses lifted up the son of the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. And then the next verse tells us the result of the cross and resurrection, that whosoever believeth in him not perish but have everlasting life. Isn't that a claim? If you believe in me, Brother Gold, you never would perish. If he's just a man, he's a madman. Who I say, now, Brother, if you believe in me, you'll go to heaven. You say, you're a fool, and I am. And Jesus is a fool, or he's God. The gospel is John 3, 14, the cross that demanded a resurrection, the lifting up of the Son of God. The result of the cross of Christ and his glorious resurrection. Hallelujah. So Jesus said that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The reason for the cross and resurrection. And what says there's enough gospel in John 3.16 save the world. There's a better gospel in John 3.16. You can put it in there, but you have to put it there. The Gospels in John 3, 14. There's the cross. There's the resurrection. The reason for the cross and resurrection. The reason we got a gospel of the cross and resurrection. That if a man believe in him who died and was raised from the dead, he'll never perish. The reason is for God. So love the world. He didn't die so God would love the world. He died because God did love the world. 
for God so loved the world. Isn't that some claim? I call your attention to another claim the Lord made while he was down here. He claimed to be perfect in holiness. He said, which of you convicted me of sin? He never prayed with his disciples. One time he ever prayed, he went off by himself. He said, which of you convicted me of sin? He said, the Father had given the Spirit to me without measure. He claimed to be perfect in holiness. I sure hope he made the right claim. I hope he's not a madman. Because I don't have to deal with the Holy Lord God. It demands perfection. And the only hope I've got of acquittal at the courtroom, the courtroom of Almighty God, is that I've got a perfect substitute, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to call your attention to another claim the Lord Jesus made. In John chapter 3, verse 35, he claimed to be the prime minister of heaven. He says, The Father loveth the Son and hath given a double L all things into his hand. Every plan of God's been turned over to the Lord Jesus Christ. As old Joseph became the prime minister down there in Egypt, so the Lord Jesus Christ says, The Father has elected me to run his plans and to carry out his eternal purposes. Everything that God purposes to do, his son's going to bring to perfection and fulfillment. You mean tell me that God Almighty has turned over everything to Jesus Christ? That's what he said. Who's I hit Lynchburg? Who's I get up if anybody comes to that afternoon meeting? And I do hope you'll hear Brother Grubb. I tell you, if I, I, I want to hear him, I thank God that it worked out so I can get to hear him once. He's a great man of God. There are no great men, but God used it. Oh, I, what an honor to even be in the same building with him. He's a choice servant of God. Suppose I get up there. Say, now, you listen to this fellow grub. He's a nice little fellow preacher, but I look down to you, look at me. I'm the prime minister of heaven. God Almighty turned over the execution of all his plans and purposes to me. Wouldn't that be something? No worse than Jesus saying it, unless it's so. If he's just a man, it can't be so. I want you to notice another stupendous claim that Jesus Christ made while he was here. He claimed that all judgment, all judgment had been turned over to him. Verse 22 of John chapter 5. For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment into the, under his Son. And he further claimed in verse 27 that not only had God Almighty turned all judgment over to him, but he'd given him authority and power to execute it. He read, I read verse 27, and hath given him, the Father's given Christ, authority to execute judgment. Because he's the son of man. I was coming back from Florida the other day, and I wasn't watching. I got off my highway. And about 10, 11 miles, I was driving by myself, and I, I noticed the signs weren't right. And I stopped at a little place, and I said, I, where, where am I? I've lost my road. How did I get back to it? Well, I said, don't go back the way you came. There's a shortcut. And so I took the shortcut, and I didn't know where I was. And I said, Going along driving about 41 miles an hour, and the cop got me. I didn't pay a great deal. I've been driving on the highway for 60, 65 miles an hour. And I didn't know I was approaching an army base. Just wasn't watching. You know, never been through that shortcut before. And uh, they had a radar there. And I was just in about three, 400 yards of uh, some big camp, Fort, Fort Stewart, down there somewhere in Georgia. And I had to... They said, you let to show up for the provo marshal tomorrow. And I said, I ain't got time to do that. And they gave me a ticket and said, well, you'll have to go back into the little town and see the judge. See the judge. 
You know, I did exactly what they told me to do. That cop, they were army uh, in the provost marshal, under the provost marshal, what do you call it, military guard, or whatever you call it. And I did exactly what that judge said. A little old judge, he's a little bitty old fella. And he let me off because I didn't know where I was. And his daddy happened to be a Baptist preacher. And I wasn't going very fast. It was in a 30 mile zone. I hadn't seen the schools or anything. I didn't pay much attention to the sign, but ignorance is no excuse. And you know that judge had authority to back of him. He had the authority of the state of Georgia. He had the authority of the government. And back of that, the authority of the President of the United States. That boy had authority. If he'd said $50, please, all on earth I could do was take it to court and pay it. Amen. I won't look you in the face and tell you, my Lord Jesus Christ said, Not only has the Father turned all judgment over to me, but he's given me authority to execute it. I'm glad it's in his hands. I'd hate to have the responsibility of casting men into hell. He has. He has. If anybody ever winds up in hell, the Lord's going to have to cast them. He's got that awful responsibility. Nobody on earth can judge except him. He said, all judgment's been turned over. So I've got authority to execute that judgment. And then I bring you one more claim. The Lord Jesus Christ from his share not only claimed to have all authority in the moral realm, not only said he is divine and came from heaven to this earth, not only said he had to die and be raised in order for you to be saved, not only claimed to be perfect in holiness, not only said he is God's prime minister running God's business, not only said that all judgment and authority to execute had been turned over to him, but when he's down here, he said, I hold the eternal destiny of every man, woman, boy, girl who ever has lived or ever will live. I hold their eternal destiny in my hand. You know what's the matter with the membership of Park Avenue Baptist Church? They saved themselves. Years ago, they heard a so-called gospel that men decided to accept Christ and it's up to men. And that Jesus is standing helplessly by with folded arms and couldn't move a peg until men made a decision. And they made a decision and still going to hell. But I wish I could get them here just once. I look them in the face and with a bleeding heart, not that they've got anything I want, but I don't want that blood on my hands at the judgment. And I say, honey, your eternal destiny is not in your hand. It's in Christ's hand. He bought you on the cross. He owns you lock, stock, and barrel. And he decides whether you spend eternity in hell or in heaven. Is that something you thought of, Brother Barnett? Not on your bottom dollar. In verse 21 of the fifth chapter of John's Gospel, I said that God, the Son, declares that he holds the destiny of all men in his hands. In verse 21, he says, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickness them, even so the Son quickness who? Whom he will. Not whom you will, but whom he will. There it is. Look at verse 26, I believe it is. Verse 26, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given the Son to have life in himself. He's the only one has got life. And he said, I'll give that life to whom I will. Then look at verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and in O.W. now is the dead, not the physical dead. He speaks about them in another verse. When the dead, dead in trespasses and sin, shall hear the voice of the Son of God, 
and they that hear shall live. Who will decide your destiny? The Lord Jesus Christ. Then and we on earth, on God's earth, you can escape being sent to hell, except to listen and hope that he'll speak the word that raises you from death to life. That's as so as I'm preaching to you now. You can get you a club and try to beat the devil out of God. You don't like it, but that's so. This damnable stuff they call the gospel that left your salvation and your old hurt perverted will when the only one that's got life is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he exercises the privilege and right of giving life to whom he will. And the only safe place for men and women come to you to say for the hundredth time since I've been here is following Christ, prospered before him, listen. And the voice of the Son of God speaks to you and say, Lazarus, come forth. The only voice that's got authority to raise men from their grave of spiritual death in sin is the voice of the Son of God. Ralph Barnett can follow and say, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst, and that's all on God's earth to send it and do. That's a little different from what they call gospel preaching, but that's the God's truth. No, sir. Jesus Christ says, I have been given control of the destiny of all men. I can cuss him or I can bow to him. I can't demand anything of him, but I can implore him. Amen. Now what's the father's response to these claims? He's made, he's lodged three things in the Lord Jesus Christ. Almighty God the Father has made a response and rendered a verdict. Here's the Father's response and answer to the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ. First, the Father has placed ex the exclusive conduct of the human race in the hands of Jesus Christ. Matthew 28, 18. All authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Who gave it to Christ the Father? Where is his authority? Both in heaven and earth. How much authority does he have? All authority. The Father given me all authority. Where? In heaven and in earth. John 17 and 2. The Lord Jesus talking to the Father as thou has given him authority over A double L all faith that includes you and includes me as thou hast given his authority over all flesh to give eternal life to as many as the Father has given me. He's gonna give you life or he's gonna send you to hell. You've been turned over to the Lord. And he's got authority to save you or to damn you. You can cuss him, go on to hell if you want to, or you can humble yourself and become a beggar and say, you, I'm in your hands. If you will, you can make me whole. That's all. That's all. That's a million miles away from what America has been hearing for the last 60 years, but I'm quoting from the Word of God. Then but one person in heaven or earth that has been given authority of the exclusive authority of the conduct of the human race. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. You better start looking to him. The Father directs all attention to his Son. The scriptures say Christ is the head of every man and the head of Christ is God. He's the only hope. 
He's been made unto us of God everything that God has for sinful men. Outside of him, there's nothing but God's wrath. Oh, young man, your destiny is in the hands of Christ, not in yours. You can't demand he save you. You can implore him to. That's all. That's all. The Father's lodged another thing in Jesus Christ. A double L, all his saving love and favor is in Jesus Christ. This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Unless God comes to the place that he sees you in Christ, he'll send you to hell. That's the reason that verse is so wonderful. We are accepted where? If we're in the beloved. That's the reason in the New Testament 262 times the exact expression or an equivalent of it. In Christ occurs. The one paramount truth of the New Testament. In Christ! Praise there by the Holy Ghost. Actually, united to it, Christ in you, the hope of glory. In you it is. There's where God's love is, and there's where God's favor is. Nowhere else. Nowhere else. They can keep on going up and down this country saying, God loves you, and Christ died for you, which neither one of them were so, until they blow in the face. God shows a benevolent love of pity, and he would do every sinner good, but he doesn't have the love of joy and delight and complacency in anybody except Jesus Christ, and unless you can get him Christ, You'll never know the real love of God. That's right, folks. Outside is the wrath of God. The wrath of God. He that believeth in the Son hath eternal life. He that obeyeth not the Son hath not life. But the wrath of God abideth on him in old of you now. Outside of Christ. Oh, my dear friend. You better hurry to Christ. You better seek to lay hold of Christ. You better quit trusting, walking an aisle and making a confession. You better come to what your fathers and mothers knew. Lay hold of Christ. He got to Christ. Don't take no for an answer. Answer until you get to Christ. And power from him comes to you. And the power to transform lives is still large. In the hands of him who's enthroned at the right hand of God. Bow at his throne. And stay there till he does his work in you. The Father's done one more thing. He's lodged in Jesus Christ alone. The power to awaken faith in a man's soul. O Ralph Barnes dead, the scripture says. In trespasses and sin. Can no more save myself. Can no more believe in Christ and no more lay a hold on Christ than a dead man can get up out of your cemetery and begin to live. All on earth that man can do is to listen. To listen. Faith cometh out by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Amen. Jesus Christ alone has that power. He awakens things in men and women as they hear him in the gospel. What's your verdict, my friends? There can be just two. The Father's made his response. He's turned your destiny over to the Son of God. The Father's made his response. He's channeled all his love through Jesus Christ. The Father has made his for response. He's given to Christ alone the power to awaken faith in the soul. What's your verdict? It's got to be one of two things. Join the crowd of people who looked him over and heard his claim in the days of his flesh. And send a message right now. We will not have this man to reign over us. 
Go down to town tomorrow. Is any Jews in town? Look at him. His forefathers and he still chants it. We will not have this man to reign over us. That's one response. That's the response of the Jewish leaders and the people. For 2,000 years, that's been the verdict of the Jewish nation with very few exceptions. Amen. Deny. I don't believe a word of it. Don't believe you're the Son of God. This man's not God's Son, this fellow Jesus. They're not three, they're just two. In marvelous grace, now, you have the choice. The day will come when you'll not have any choice. By force, God will make you bow down to his son. Too late for salvation, but not too late for the glory of the Father. But now, although I can't explain it, it's too good to believe. Almighty God, who has all power, you can make a choice here. You can render a verdict. I will not bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. Will not die. Or you can say, I will. I will. I will. My friends, there's a solemn silence in the soul when men pass their verdict on the claims of Christ. I will not submit to it, or I will. There'll be a solemn silence of the soul when God passes his verdict on them at the judgment. I want to ask you this Friday night, rainy Friday night. You didn't go buy groceries and go to pick the show or rest or something. You're here. What's your verdict? What's your verdict? It's all or nothing. It's absolute surrender, or it's absolute refusal. It's got to be one of them. I close by asking those of you interested to turn with me to the 13th chapter of the book of Matthew and tell you we'll close with the words of our Lord. Beginning at verse 44, the Lord describes people who get saved, as we call it, here it is in verse 44 of Matthew 13. The Lord said again, The kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. The which, when a man found that treasure, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he has buy that field so he can get that treasure. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a, a, a merchant man. He's looking for goodly pearls. And when he found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. And if you want to come into a personal experience of salvation with the Lord Jesus Christ, You'll sell everything you've got. You'll leave everything you've got. You'll say goodbye potentially to everything you've got. Nothing will stand in your way until you find him as the treasure of your soul and the pearl of great price. None of this walking the aisle and shaking the preacher's hand. No, no, brother, you don't mean business if you have get Christ. The kingdom of God. People get in the kingdom of God. They're the folks to illustrate. Man found a treasure and he hid it. He hot tailed at the time, sold everything he had, and went and bought that rail. So he'd get that treasure. Another fellow's a fellow looking for good little pearls, and he found the pearl of great price, and he sold everything he had. Purchased that pearl. Brother. Jesus Christ is God. You'll go after him with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul until you find him. For God will cast you into hell. It's just that simple. Will you bow your head?
What verdict, my dear one, have you brought in and sent to God? I will not go after with all my heart and soul, full surrender and devotion, your eternal son. He cannot rule in my life. That's your verdict? Or is your verdict, he's my Lord, my Savior, my treasure, my pearl of great price, everything I am and have, I say goodbye to him. Potentially, you have to do that. You'll never own another dime of money in your life if you ever get to Jesus. You won't own your home or your car or nothing else. It's all his. You won't own your wife or your children. They're all his. You're going to sell everything you've got potential. Amen? And buy this precious pearl. That's what the scriptures mean. In the day thou shalt seek me with all thine heart, I shall surely be found of thee. What 